Cities of America offer every convenience. Food and fun are available at every turn in the road. But cities are also the most dangerous creations ever fostered by mankind. And should there be a disaster, there's only one person you can turn to for help. Yourself. Remember, you are just one person in all of this. Welcome to volume one of the Urban Master series where we teach you to be the Urban Master. My name is Ron Hood and in this volume of the Urban Master we're going to be covering a lot of topics about urban survival. I've got to tell you that Karen and I have stressed over this, uh, over this topic for quite some time. You see the urban environment is much more complex and dangerous than the wilderness environment. And trying to put some sort of order into the chaos that the urban environment represents was a, a real challenge for us. You see, there are so many interlocking pieces of urban survival that we had to find some way that we could distinguish these pieces and make it so it's a logical progression of information for you, so you'll be able to master the subject. So what we've done is we've broken this gargantuan topic down into five videos. The first one, the one you're going to see now, is called The Home. The next one will be Away From Home, and then we'll be talking about threats to your person, we're going to be talking about urban skills and finally about recovery. So those are the five basic topic areas that we're going to be discussing in these videos. The goal of this video isn't to give you every answer to every specific catastrophe that could befall you. We're not going to be getting into the specifics of earthquake or tornado or hurricane survival. We figured for that information you'll go to local authorities. What we want to do here is give you good solid basic information for home preparations. We want you to know that the things that you need to do to assure your family's safety are things that you can do, and you'll find those in this video. In addition to other things, in this first video we're going to be talking about food storage and so forth. Now there's something important to understand about storage. You see, if you're storing food in a non-disaster time, you're just storing food. You've put things aside for an emergency. Now, if there's an emergency and you rush out and you buy everything that you can, it becomes hoarding. You're not hoarding if you put your stuff aside in advance. By storing food in advance, you're actually taking pressure off of the supply system. You're making it possible for someone who wasn't as far-sighted as yourself to get some food. So I want to recommend that you do the storage thing. Put stuff aside. It'll save you from having to go out there with the hoarders, and you're going to feel secure having this stuff in hand. Now there's something about food storage that you need to know, and I call it the big mistake. The big mistake came to me something like this. When Karen and I first moved to, uh, to Idaho years ago, why we were moving some stuff off of the moving van, <clears throat> and among that stuff was our food supplies. One of the neighbors came by and saw the food, and he says, Whoa, well, what's all this stuff you got here? I says, Oh, well, it's uh, emergency food. And he says, Oh, I know who I'm going to kill first when uh, there's a disaster. Well, that kind of got me thinking, and I said to him, well, you know, I guess if I see you after disaster, you're the first one I'm going to shoot. 
But that's not a situation that I really want to be involved in, you see. What happened here is he found out that I had something that he might want someday. The big mistake is letting your neighbors know that you have these supplies. Now it's okay to say, yo, look, I put aside three or four days of supplies. But if they know you've got three months and they're starving out there, they're going to want to get to it. Now it's up to you to decide whether or not you want to share with them. But you can't share with the whole world. And in my book, my family comes first. So you need to not make the big mistake. Well, I guess that's enough about that topic. Let's get started and let's see a little bit about how to store food. I want to talk a little bit about food storage. Most people already have some food in their kitchen. And in case of an emergency with loss of power, the first food that you are going to want to eat is the food that's in your refrigerator and your freezer because that's going to spoil first. Now, if your emergency lasts longer than that, then you're going to have to rely on your storage supplies. And uh, the easiest, bless you, Jesse, the easiest and most economical way that you can get your storage supplies up is uh, a technique that Ron and I have been using for years, and it's called copy canning. We keep food in several locations in our house, but our main food storage area is in the basement. Let me show you. We like to store our food in several different areas in the house, but the place I'm going to show you right now is our main pantry. If you don't have a basement, don't worry. Just find a real cool area in your house to store your food. You want it to last the longest that it can. In other words, do not store it in your attic or under a black sheet in the backyard. You want it to stay cool. Well, here it is. This is our storage area. One of the things that we always keep um, in our storage area is um, some kind of light source right by the door. Because when you come down here, it's dark and we do need some sort of light source. We have two light sources. One that uh, we can put around our neck if we'd like to. It's called a PAL light. It's, uh, it is a, um, a light that runs on one 9 volt battery and it's constantly in the on position so when we open up the door and it's pitch black, black down here we can actually see where we're going with it. It's got uh, several different settings. It'll run for two years on that uh, always on on one battery and if you have it on the high section it will uh, it'll run for approximately one week if you kept it on the whole time. The other one that we have here is a fluorescent light. This is a nice one too. It's, it's battery powered and uh, it's got a nice little hook on it. You know, this, these are just things to think about, things that you might need for your family. I do recommend that uh, everybody does have flashlights that are easy to get to. That's, that's a good key. Um, we have all of these uh, items right here. I'll just explain a little bit about how we've organized here. You don't have to be, you know, super organized, but uh, you do need to have these put in sections so you can see about how much you have of each thing. If you have them all scattered, it's hard to tell what you really have. So up here we have what we consider comfort foods, and this is uh, alcoholic beverages. And um, if you don't drink, don't worry. You can still have this in here. It's good for barter if anything were to happen. You need to barter with uh, one of your neighbors for some kind of goodie. We've got uh, sanitary things here, baby, baby diapers, cloth baby diapers, toilet um, paper, uh, baby supplies, which are very important if you have uh, babies, which we do. Uh, fuels, batteries, very important batteries. These do not run without batteries, so batteries are very important. Uh, we have certain spices down here. This is my Asian section. I do like Asian food. Over here we have our medicines and first aid. We also have a book, which is a good thing to, to have, a book on medicine and first aids. Any, and anything like that would be good for you if you're in a survival situation. We've got all of our potato flakes, kind of our pasta, potato flaky, polenta kind of stuff right in here, all of our noodles. Down here I have uh, some more baby supplies. And a good thing to, um, to know is you can buy um, uh, baby wipes and baby uh, diapers cheaper at warehouse stores, which um, is also a good point too because you can buy other things here at warehouse stores. The bottom shelf, we have um, anything having to do with drinks. We've got um, coffee, you know, uh, instant breakfast uh, drinks, things like that. Those are always easy to, to fix. Now up here we have canned goods, we have like preserves, anything having to do with baking, all-purpose flour, any bread, bread mixes, things like that. Down here are just an a interesting mix of uh, uh, any kind of canned, canned food here. 
and um, bras, things like that. We do have a whole box here that I have collected full of spices and spice packets, things like that to make things taste good. And these are condiments. These are sauces and condiments, vinaigrettes, um, and cookies are down here, cookies. And if the power comes on, here's your bread machine if you don't know how to make bread <laughs> from scratch <laughs> or by hand. Very important paper plates and cups because uh, in a, a survival situation uh, or an emergency situation, you aren't going to have the extra water to wash with. You're not going to want to use your extra water to wash with, in other words. So these are easy. You can just use them and throw them out. Here's another section where we keep our goods that we copy can. And up at the top are some more uh, drinks and coffee. We do drink coffee here. On the second shelf here, we have uh, some more canned goods. And these are canned goods that we do use on a regular basis upstairs. That's why I have them separate a little bit uh, uh, from my other foods. Um, and down here is where I keep our meats and um, whole chickens, uh, things like that. Anything having to do with protein is in this area so I can see about how much protein we have. And down on the bottom is, uh, is freeze-dried food. And, and uh, we do have some freeze-dried food. This particular refrigerator is not on, but we use it as a very good storage for more uh, freeze-dried foods and the reason we do that is because these freeze-dried foods are uh, a little older than the rest of the things in our pantry we haven't used them and I'll talk about that in a little bit um, and uh, the inside of a refrigerator is a very good storage area it's a very um, constant temperature and uh, which makes uh, it's constant and cool especially being down here so that's just a good tip here's an example of how copy canning works I have broken this down into three different uh, sections. One of these is to eat. This is wh what we will be eating. This is what we have in our pantry. And this is at the market. This is, this is my little market right there. So say one day that I decide that I really need a Spam sandwich. So I go upstairs or go downstairs to my pantry and I see that I have a can of Spam. So what I do is I take it up to eat it and it's gone. I don't have it anymore. So I need to add it to my shopping list. So that's what I do. I add it to my shopping list. Spam. So I will not forget to buy Spam at my next outing at the market. I go to the market and I don't buy one can, I buy two, thus copy canning. Copy canning by two, okay? I buy two cans of Spam and I come home and I put it in my pantry. Now I have two cans of Spam. Next week, I decide I really need another Spam sandwich. I come down and I get one can and I eat it and it's gone. But I still have one can left. So since I did take one can out of the pantry, I write on my shopping list again spam, so on my next outing to the market, I'll buy two more, two more to the pantry. Next week again, spam sandwich, two left. Spam on the shopping list. I buy two, but because I'm getting sick of spam, I actually buy some corned beef too. So next week, I decide I need a corned beef sandwich. Take it instead of spam. Corned beef, CB, my wonderful writing here. I get some corned beef and I buy two more. You see how they, there's not two here, but you can see how each week by buying a little more and a little more of what you already eat, you're going to pretty quickly um, have a good food, food storage area built up. And it's really not going to be a lot of money out of your pocket all at one time. You buy foods that you, you use on a regular basis. An other quick tip that I do is when I take my, when I buy my food and I put it in the pantry, I'll actually write the date on it. So I know how long it's been in there. If there's any question, I know. That's copy canning. That's how easy it is. Grains and rice are an inexpensive way to increase the size of your larder and can be made to store for long periods of time using this technique and all it involves is one pound of dry ice and a barrel. You can get dry ice at butcher shops and you'll need about one pound per barrel. This is how our dry ice came and I want to make sure that you do not ever touch dry ice with your hand. Even gloves are not a good protection against it. Dry ice is extremely cold and you're going to want something like tongs, something like this, 
to handle it with. When you go to split it, just stab it and don't twist your blade because you don't want the blade to break off. It could freeze your blade. So that's how you're going to want to do it. And be sure to wear glasses. If you get this stuff in your eyes, it's going to freeze them and you do not want that. You start by lining your barrel with a plastic bag. Then you take whatever grain you're going to be storing and put it down on in there. Then you take a half of a pound of your dry ice on a paper plate and put it, put it in there. Then you can take, you still have some room, take whatever else you're going to put in there, some oats, put it in there, and take your other half pound of dry ice on a paper plate and put it in there. The next step is to close the bag up, but do not seal it. Close it up loosely and then put the lid on it very loosely. The reason we're doing this is because the dry ice is omitting carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide is heavier than air and what it's going to do is going to the carbon dioxide is going to expand in there and fill from the bottom of the can up and once it gets up here it's going to this top is going to act like a valve and the carbon dioxide will flow out but it will not allow air to get back in that's going to make an environment of carbon dioxide in here and that's an environment that the bugs cannot live in this is the ring that you're eventually going to seal this with but you're going to want to let this uh, sit overnight you want to make sure that you do not seal this as soon as you put your ice in there you want to make sure that that ice is dissipated and it's completely gone uh, by the time you put this in here the reason is is because that carbon dioxide uh, develops pressure that could become dangerous if you were to put this on too early so you want to wait until the next day when all of that ice is dissipated and when you seal this up and you cinch it up real tight it's going to create a uh, airtight seal and this grain will be able to be stored for 10 20 years earthquake country it's a good idea to get some wire and secure your things so they don't fall down we use electric fence wire this is really inexpensive wire you can get about a quarter of a mile for under ten dollars and it'll help hold some of your goods in in case there is an earthquake if you need to tighten your wire just take your pliers and put a kink in it and you'll see how easy that tightens that up another point is get your spices in you're going to need spices. They'll make even the nastiest food taste good. And get your vitamins in. In a stressful situation, you are going to need your vitamins. I mentioned before that we keep our survival supplies in several different places. This is a good example of a different place that we keep our survival supplies. This is an old steamer trunk, and we keep about a three-week supply of miscellaneous foods and other supplies in here. And we also have this trunk where we keep additional survival supplies. Let me show you another area in our house where we keep some more. Another food storage area that is neglected sometimes is right here underneath your bed. And that's where we keep our meals ready to eat. And these are in small boxes, so if we have to boogie and get out of this house quickly, we just take the boxes and run. There are four rules that Ron and I like to recommend when you're trying to get your storage supplies up. Number one, buy foods that you can afford. Number two, buy foods that you're familiar with. Number three, buy your foods on sale or at wholesale discount stores. And number four, focus on trying to get enough food in for three months of survival. Mm, tastes good, but this is not a well-balanced meal. Let me show you what you need to focus on getting into your pantry. Here's a well-balanced meal. This is enough for two people. We've got a high-quality meat, turkey, fruit, vegetable, and a couple apple juices, and you're ready to go. Now, Spam and beer is not a bad meal, but I promise you, if you ate it for two weeks straight, you'd want to kill yourself. So get variety in your storage. As I said to you before, we don't really eat our dehydrated food, and I'll tell you why. I have three chicken noodle dinners here. These are both dehydrated. This one's canned. 
This one is a commercially available dehydrated food, and I bought it for $4.99. This makes one and a half cups of food. I bought this for $1. This makes one and a half cups of food. This makes three cups of food, and I don't need to do anything else to it except eat it. Now, the advantage of these type of foods is that they do store for long periods of time. The disadvantage is they both require water that may be in short supply if you're in an emergency situation, and you also have to boil these waters and cook them for seven to ten minutes. This is already ready. It's already got the required uh, water in it, and if you need to eat it, you could eat it cold, but if you really needed to eat it, you wouldn't need any power. You would just need the sun. And if you have my cave cooking video, I will show you how to make this box cooker and use the sun to heat a nutritious canned food. As I mentioned to you before, we keep a couple of boxes of MREs underneath our bed. They're, they're there, readily available for us, just in case we need to get out of here as quickly as possible. We just take them, throw them in our car, and get the heck out of here and we'll have our food with us. They're MREs, Meals Ready to Eat, and a lot of people call them Meals Rejected by Everyone, and I kind of take offense to that because I kind of like them. They taste really good, but I do eat bugs sometimes, so, you know. Anyway, um, MREs come to you like this. They're packaged in a really heavy-duty uh, bag. It's a plastic bag, and they have different menus on them. This one says Menu 4, this one says Menu 2. You, usually when you buy them, you buy them in a case, and you can, um, sometimes you can mix and match different kinds of foods if you like. Let me show you what's in them. They usually have, um, well, they always have a main course. It's usually about a cup of food, and all you have to do is open it up and eat it. That's all you have to do. Uh, comes usually with a cracker of some sort with some kind of topping for it, either cheese or, in this case, strawberry jam. Uh, usually comes with a cookie, different kinds of cookies you can get. And when you become a MRA connoisseur, you can pick the cookie that you like. They also come with utensils and salt and pepper and um, usually a little bit of toilet paper, maybe a couple of pieces of gum and drink mix. And basically all you need to do is provide your own water. These are a really good, easy way to uh, store your foods. You can store them in your car. I, in fact, I have one box that's been in my car for five years or so, and I wouldn't hesitate eating it today. I mean, these things just stay fresh. The only uh, thing about them is they're a little more expensive than, um, than canned foods, uh, but they are very, very well worth the price. Now, Karen did a great job explaining all the wonderful food you could store, but someday you're going to have to, well, delete the chow that you've been storing. And when it comes time to do that, you're going to need some place to delete it into. Now the Red Cross talks a little bit about that, but basically they just say, well, you need some sanitary supplies. Well, what do you do for sanitary supplies and how do you actually go about the deletion? Well, let me show you our solution. It starts out with a big metal can here. And inside the can, why, I've got a couple of white lids. I'll show you why we have those in a minute. A $5 toilet seat. That's important. And down at the bottom, another bucket. Now let me show you how this all goes together. First of all, we've got some aqua chem, and I'll talk about that in a minute here. Some more bags. More aqua chem, another bag. Here's how it goes. You see, I've got a plain old uh, bucket here. This is a painter's bucket. I guess, what does this hold? Uh, about three and a half gallons. And it's a good sturdy one. You want a good solid one because you see, you're going to be putting that toilet seat right on top like so. That looks familiar, doesn't it? Now, you see, if you throw yourself on top of this and you uh, actually sit on it and it's a cheap bucket, well, you're going to slide right down into that uh, uh, deletion, and uh, that's going to be a mess. So you want a good, solid bucket so you can uh, enjoy yourself. Uh, and, of course, look, it's just like home. Now, what happens is this. You perform your mystic evolution, and uh, everything is taken care of. And you feel fine about that. Now, there's probably going to be some kind of an odor. So what we like to suggest is something here called uh, Aqua Chem. This, one partic this particular one is a holding tank deodorant, and, um, and it also tends to sanitize. You can, if you want to, just use a, uh, a little bleach. But with this here, all you do is you take a teaspoon. That yeah, would be this one here. Take a teaspoon, put a teaspoon of the Aqua Chem into your... Uh, <coughs> units there and um, close this baby up. Now this little bag here, unless you're incredibly prolific, is probably going to last a family for at least a day. Uh, 
while that day is going on, you probably don't want to just leave this in place. So it's a good idea to get out one of these covers and sit this on the top. And that'll help keep the, uh, the odors down and the dogs from eating out of it. After you're, um, you're completed uh, your, your process and everything, and you've decided that this has reached the point of no return, well, you take the bag and you just seal it up like so and throw a little knot in it. Now, you notice over here we've got the metal can. This metal can has a liner, and the liner is made out of a contractor's trash bag. And what we do now is we take our, our full load, drop it in there. And then after you've dropped it in there, of course, you put the cover on it, just in case there's a little seepage. And this will sit there happily for uh, quite some time. Now, I would imagine this will hold something like a month's supply, uh, unless you've got a large family or you're busy. And um, after you've completed uh, it, you think that it's about as heavy as you can lift. And remember that you don't want to fill this baby all the way to the top. That's something like 30 gallons. So, eh. Kind of when you get, it seems to feel a little bit heavy, while well, you just take this thing here, tighten it up, and put it someplace where the animals can't get to it. Put it in a new black bag and go back to work again. This is how we handle sanitation in our household, and I think it's a good tip for you, too. Whenever we talk about survival in the home, we've got to talk about the weak spots in that home. And one of the weakest areas in a home is going to be the windows. Now you see, if a burglar is breaking into your house, he's going to go through a window. He's not going to go through a wall. Windows are a lot easier to move around. And it doesn't take a burglar to open up a window. Hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, uh, firestorms, atomic bombs, and viruses can all penetrate a window. So one of the first things we need to do if we think that there's going to be an emergency or if one's actually happening is to get to work fixing those windows so they no longer represent a threat. And to do that, we need two things. One, plenty of duct tape, and two, plastic sheeting. Let me tell you a little bit more about those. <sighs> There's the plastic. What we keep around our house is this stuff here. This is four mil clear plastic. It's not actually clear, it's got a little greenish tint to it. But this stuff is actually the plastic that's used as an underlayment for hardwood floors. It's waterproof. Now the roll itself is only four feet tall, but when you cut it, you see it makes an eight foot long piece, which means that when you're cutting things for your windows and so forth, it's a lot easier to get the right size. You just unfold it. And it's a good strong plastic. It'll take a lot of abuse. You don't want that thin stuff that you use for Oh, for covering stuff up when you're painting and so forth. You want something that's anywhere from two to four mil and, and even thicker if you can. This queen is one form of stuff that, that works out very, very well. It's a heavy duty under concrete kind of plastic, but it's black and you can't see through it. But this is the stuff that we've chosen. Now let me show you how to put this stuff in place. Let's say for the sake of argument that we want to secure this window here because we're going to use the room we're in as our little emergency hideout during the upcoming emergency. And the first thing I want to do is I want to tape this window. Now you'll notice I've got a little flap on the tape. That's so I can just rip this tape off and start taping right away. If you're in a hurry, you don't want to be scratching at your tape trying to, to get the end of it and get started. So I just grab that little tab and starting up at the corner, just a few inches from the corner, like this, we draw a line in an X down towards the other corner, like this. That doesn't have to go all the way to the edge of the, uh, of the glass. After we've got one piece on, we go up to the other corner, throw on another strip. Again, you don't need to go all the way to the ends. Now what the tape does is if this window starts to break, it's going to keep the pieces together and stop them from being projectiles. You could add more tape to it, but usually a couple of crosses like this will be enough for the average window. Now the next thing we want to do is secure the window from in air infiltration. That means we need to put some plastic up here to stop anything that might come in. We never know what might be coming in on the pressure wave that's going to be breaking this window. That's where the plastic comes in. 
With the plastic, all we do is drag it up so it fully covers the window itself. Then we go down and we mark about where the bottom of the window is going to be. At that point, we fold the plastic to give ourselves a line to cut on. Get out our handy dandy pocket knife and just strip it down like so. Now, obviously that doesn't cover the window. Remember this plastic is doubled over. So when we go like this, now we have plenty of plastic. The next step is to staple it or tape it in place. Before we throw the plastic up though, we're going to go ahead and lower these blinds. They'll act as another layer of defense from flying glass and kind of protect the people inside. You can set these things, of course, so that it lets light in or not. That's your choice. But if I, I usually point them like this, so they're, they're pointed down a little bit, and I can see outside onto the ground. Now it's time for the plastic. Well, that's all there is to it. Now, this window is secure from air infiltration and debris that might fly through, at least the lower velocity stuff. But there is an aside to this. If, let's say that you've run out of uh, power to heat your home and you need to keep the place warm, something like this will also serve to give you extra insulation from the outside. So in colder weather, this kind of thing here can make a big difference to the temperature of your room and, and drastically reduce the amount of energy it takes to heat that same room. One of the things that Karen mentioned is that you need to store about a gallon per person per day. Now that water is for drinking and for cooking and not for cleaning up. Now there's a lot of different ways to store your water and I've seen a lot of different things that people have tried to do. They store the two and a half gallon containers and they get 50 gallon containers and so on and so forth. But whatever you do it's going to be a pain in the butt and a lot of people aren't going to want to do it because it is a pain. Let me show you how we do ours. We have this downstairs refrigerator and inside we keep things to drink. We've got a We've got uh, uh, fruit drinks and so forth. We've got bottled waters like this, so we could take one or two a day and ration those the way we want. Uh, we've got some Cokes, we've got some beers and so forth. And, and back in the thing itself, we've got big bottles of drinks like this and a few bottles of water as well. Another thing we keep in this refrigerator is medications. We try to keep about a, well, a good supply of, of different kinds of medications that we might need in an emergency. For instance, we've got uh, uh, ampicillin and penicillin and different things like that for the animals. Um, it's a good place to keep your medications and be sure you've got at least a month or two supply of extra medications on hand. Just talk to your doctor. He'll give you a prescription for them when he knows what you want it for. But this is basically our drinking water and uh, coffee making water and so forth. Now in a real emergency, you're going to need to turn to something that has a little bit more volume and for that we use the hot water heater. So to get to that, first we move the honey bucket which is filled with old water and then we move this. This is your standard 40 gallon hot water heater. Not a gallon a day, obviously that means you've got 40 days right here. But there's something you need to know about this thing. In fact, there's a few things you need to know about it before you start using it. Let me show you those. First of all, all water heaters have an off. Uh, this is your water main water supply. This is where the cold water comes in, right up here. And there's a big valve on it that you need to turn to the off position. You turn that clockwise, so you're screwing it in to turn it off. Right next to that, up here on the top, most of these devices have one of these. This is a high pressure let off valve. The idea behind this is if it gets too hot in here and pressure starts to build up, rather than having the thing explode, they put one of these on. And this way the pressure will release down through the pipe and get out of there. Now there's a reason for me to tell you about that, and I'll show you more of that in just a minute. This model here is a gas 
um, hot water heater. And I, I like gas because gas is one of the few utilities that tends to stay on in times of an emergency. Power will go out, water might go out, but your gas will probably stay on. This valve here shuts off the gas to the hot water heater. As an emergency develops, shut off this gas. You're going to be shutting it off outside as well. To shut it off, turn this valve so it is across the pipe. All of these valves are set up the same way. They go straight up and down, that's the direction the gas flows. They turn sideways like so, it shuts the gas off. Down here at the bottom is the business end. This is the piece that controls the temperature of your water. Now, this isn't so important in an emergency, but right next to it is the thing that you want because this is how you're going to tap the water off. This is your outlet valve. Now, I need to tell you something about water heater maintenance before we start getting into that. This outlet valve here is, is an important part of maintaining your hot water heater, and a lot of people don't even know about it. You see, this hot water heater acts like a great big sediment tank. And every year or so, you should drain this thing because if you let it go for too long, it's going to fill up with dirt and mud and so forth, and when you turn this on, nothing might come out. So every year or so, you should connect a hose to it, run it outside, shut off the main water inline, and open this baby up and let the water flush out. As the water drains out of the hot water heater, turn on the water at the top again to give it pressure, and that'll surge, wash all of this junk out. If I turn this on right now, you can see how it's spurting. Now, we haven't, we haven't um, cleaned this <clears throat> for a year. And if you can see down in here, the water looks muddy. And that's what you're going to get out of your hot water heater the first time you turn it on. So if you wait until an emergency, you're just going to get a lot of muddy water to start out. So be sure you clean it. Now, one of the problems that you might have when you, ha when you do that is this. If this valve has never been disturbed and it's an old water heater, it may leak like this one is doing right now. So you're going to need to turn it with a little bit of effort until it, sh it finally shuts off. You may even need to leave a bucket under it for a little while until it does stop leaking. But this is where you're going to get your water in an emergency. Now let's go back up to the top. Let's pretend that we've just had an emergency, an earthquake or something like that. Now one of the things we want to make sure to do is to isolate your hot water supply from the main lines. You see, if, a, if there's an earthquake or some other disaster like that, there's going to be a lot of sediment that's in the lines in the ground outside of your house, and that's going to tend to migrate down into your hot water heater. So your first step is going to be shut off the gas. Shut off the gas or electric to your, to your hot water heater. Step number two, shut off the incoming water to your water heater. Make sure it's good and tight. Step number three you could do down here or you could do it at any hot water faucet in your house. And that's simply to release the pressure in your hot water tank. You can see a little bit of water came out. That's to keep you from being scalded when you go to step number four. Step number four is harvest your water and that'll be down here. At that point you see not much water is coming out. Why is that? That's because air can't get in to let it out. When you lift the pressure valve at the top, it allows that water to flow out freely. And at that point, you can use the water in your hot water heater for survival. And that's it. 40 gallons of good water, always stored, always ready to go. So make sure that you do the maintenance on your hot water heater so when there's an emergency, you've got it available. Something else you need to keep in your house for emergencies is a lighter, something like this. They're inexpensive. They got a, <laughs> there it goes. They got a long reach so you don't have to stick your fingers back in a hole to light pilot lights and stuff like that. Also, if you have a gas stove in your kitchen, a lot of those things have electronic ignition. Well, the gas may be on, but the electronics will be off because the power is down. And one of these things is indispensable for lighting your stove back up. This note could be one of the most important things you do for yourself and for your family. And it's inside the refrigerator. Let me show you what I mean. This bottle contains all the information an emergency worker might need about you 
or your family. Let's take a look at it. There are a lot of good reasons for putting your information in the refrigerator. Let me give you a couple of them. First one is that emergency crews are taught to look in the refrigerator for just this kind of information. Another one is the refrigerator is fairly fire resistant. If your house burns down, there's a good chance that the information is still going to be available to you. So if you need to contact your insurance agent, that information is going to be in your refrigerator. Another reason you might have it in there is if you've got a babysitter or something like that and something happens, if you tell the babysitter that the contact information is in a jar in the refrigerator, it's hard for them to make a mistake. So you want to make it easy for whoever finds this jar to contact you and the emergency services. Let's take a look inside the bottle. The jar is an old olive jar and all we did is clean it up. Now you notice that there's a sign that says uh, emergency. That little note is inside the bottle. If you put a, a note on the outside, it's going to tend to get discolored or wet and so forth from being in the refrigerator. So everything you want to read is inside this waterproof jar. Now let's open that baby up. First thing that you, you see coming out here is, well, there's one of them. There's the other one. These little guys here. These are desiccant or drying tablets that I find in, in bottles of aspirin and so forth. Whenever you get a bottle of aspirin or vitamins and you find one of these, save it. That you can put inside the jar and it will help to keep the moisture level down inside the jar and that of course makes the paper last a little longer. So put those in there. This is the actual note. You'll notice that it was set up in here so that it'll fall right out. If somebody's hands are shaking, you don't want them to have to go and try to get it out. You want it to fall right out. It's got a little rubber band around it. Now what we've got in here on this note is just the basic information that you're going to need in an emergency. The outside stuff here tells you who to contact in terms of uh, the services. So we've got the emergency services number on one side and over on the other is the information that we're going to need about you. This is the stuff that you should fill in. And of course the note I've got here is just generic. Let me explain a little bit about the topic areas that go into the note. The information inside your bottle should contain the material that you see here at the minimum. Now you can always add more information like photocopies of your driver's license or anything that you want to save. But this is the primary information you need. You need the names and ages of all of your family members. You need your actual address, your phone numbers for your home, your cell phone numbers and your pager numbers as well, your work phone numbers, you also need an emergency contact person. This would be the name, phone number, and relationship of a person you've designated as a contact person in case of an emergency. This will also be the same person that you would contact if you needed to uh, uh, give information about an emergency to them. We'll be talking about that more later. Uh, your doctor's name and phone numbers. Your home and car insurance agent's names and numbers. If your house burns down or your car gets mashed, you probably don't want to be looking around for this information. Just have it available right here on this note. You know right where it is. You also want your medical insurance information. This will be the policy number and any other information that's pertinent. You also need a special medical information for every member of your family. Put in there whether or not they have any allergies to medications or bees or anything else. You want to put on their blood type of the family members. And another thing is if they have any special medications that they're required to take. You should put those on there and the dosages. Then there's a general emergency number information portion. These would be the numbers that someone would contact in case of an emergency. Let's say that the house is burning down. They take this bottle, shake it out. Oh yeah, I call 911. What if it's not available? Then you need the phone number for the fire department. You need the police and sheriff's phone numbers. Remember 911 could get jammed in an emergency but these numbers might not be jammed at all. You also need a, an ambulance phone number, the number of the hospital emergency. Uh, the purpose for this is if some member is missing and you need to call emergency numbers, you, you ought to get the emergency numbers for the local hospitals. Another thing to put on there is the address that's, that these emergency services would respond to and this would be uh, your address. Now also add the cross streets you might not be able to think about that when you're kind of uh, stressed out during an emergency. So you call up 911, you say, I live at such and such a street. These are the cross streets. Please, I need a fire department or I need uh, the police department or whatever it is. But this sheet, all of this information will be invaluable in times of an emergency. 
Before I show you the next little tip, I want to tell you a short story. Back in 1971, I was living in Southern California in the San Fernando Valley when we had an earthquake. It was early in the morning and that place just started to shake. I heard stuff breaking, boards breaking, glasses breaking, things snapping and popping and crashing and carrying on and it was a little bit frightening. And I started to think about the old telephone pole hanging over the top of my house. That got me even more worried. Finally, I decided I'd better get out of that shaken bed and make my way to the outside. So I started to run. I ran down the hallway and along the way I discovered that all of the dishes and, and bottles and glasses and things that had been stored in, uh, in shelves along the hallway had fallen out and I was stepping on glass. Well, I had a choice. I could run back to bed or I could keep on going and I decided to keep on going. That brought me into the kitchen and there I discovered an interesting thing, another interesting thing. All of the cupboards had decided to discharge their contents onto the floor and I had a huge amount of broken glasses and dishes. Now this is a real mess and about then there wasn't any more shaking so I tiptoed outside with my bloody feet. From that I took a couple of lessons. One, always keep a pair of stur a sturdy shoes by the side of your bed in case of an emergency like this. And the other one is do something to secure your cupboards and cabinets so the contents don't fall out onto the ground and impede your ability to get to safety. Let's take a look at some of those latches. Right after that incident, I installed these types of latches on all of the, uh, the shelves and uh, all of the cupboards in the house. They're just little depression safety things for children. You see, it keeps the kids out, but it also secures the contents of the cabinet in case of an emergency. You just press down like that and it opens right up. These are great. Since then, we've had other earthquakes and they've worked like a charm. They keep everything inside and and secure and I recommend these kinds of things. Now one quick point, if you've got upper cupboards that you're trying to put these on, make sure you don't put them at eye level so when you open it up this baby here whacks you in the melon. So put them where you're not going to hit them with your face, your teeth or something and um, I think you'll feel secure having those on there. In an emergency you may be told to shut off your gas and electric. Let me show you how to do that. This is a standard gas meter here. This is the type you'll probably have at your home or your apartment for that matter. To shut it off, you don't want to be running around looking for a, uh, a tool in the middle of an emergency. So what you ought to do is attach your wrench to this thing so it's permanently in place. Now, if you want to shut off your gas, remember you should wait for instructions to do so. You simply drop the wrench over the little valve. The valve is this vertical face that you see here. And then turn like so until the valve is crosswise to the pipe and that will shut off your gas. Don't turn your gas back on until the gas company tells you to or they come out and do it for you. If you need to shut off your power, what you need to do is, is look for one of these little glass balls here. This is your power meter and this always indicates where your, your power is coming in. And somewhere near there, there's going to be a box with a cover on it generally. And inside that box, you might find something that looks a little different with a lot of switches on it. But one of those switches is going to be the main power switch, and it'll probably be up at the top. All you need to do is throw that to the off position, and that shuts the power off to your home. Your water shutoff valve should be in a box like this close to the street. There's generally some kind of a cover on it like so, and down in there you'll find the valve. Now some of these valves have like a cross piece on it, and you'll need a special tool. Others are going to have just a valve that you rotate with your hand. But in any case, you should try to turn the thing off and on as a practice measure before an emergency. In our case, we have a straight line down there, much like the, the valve on the gas line. And it's way down in the ground like this because it freezes here. What is this device? This device is a water valve shutoff tool. If you live in a cold area of the country where your water valve is way down in the ground like ours is, you're going to need one of these things. Where do you get it? Any good hardware store in the area where you have buried pipes like ours should be able to sell you one. Water coming into your house means that there's water pipes connected to it. Now if the water pressure out there fails, it's possible that once it does fail, the rest of the system will act like a siphon and draw the water right out of your house and that would include the water in your hot water heater. So it's important to have a plumber install an anti-siphon valve on the main line coming into your house from the outside supply. A lot of people who have hot tubs and swimming pools think that they've got a nearly inexhaustible supply of fresh water. 
The fact is they don't. You see something like a hot tub here is going to be absorbing your sweat and body flakes and all kinds of other weird stuff and that's not really good water. In fact, um, as you add more water to it, the salts that come off of your skin are going to be increasing in density as they go along. In other words, this becomes pretty salty water after a while. And I don't think it's the kind of water you're going to want to drink anyway because that filtration that's in here doesn't really clean up the goodies. You know what I mean? Same thing with swimming pools. You've got chlorine, you've got all kinds of other toxic, potentially toxic chemicals in there. What's that water good for? Well, I suppose if you had a reverse osmosis filter or some other way of taking the salts out, it would be good drinking water. Otherwise, it's good washing water. So consider this kind of water to be something that you use for washing dishes, washing yourself, or washing your pots and pans. But don't think of it as drinking water. Two more things to think about. One of them is always have a manual can opener available. When the power goes out, you're going to have to get into these cans somehow. So keep that on hand. The second thing is a red flag or a napkin in this case. And what this is a universal code. And what you would do is talk to your neighbors and tell them you're going to set up a universal code. If you put a flag like this, a red one, outside on your front door or on your fence post somewhere where people can see it easily, that will signify that you need help or need assistance. If it's a white flag or no flag, that would mean that you're okay. So you can tell your neighbors about it. Just something for you to think about. These days, everybody has one of these phones, a nice portable phone. They work great. You can walk just about anywhere, and you've always got a phone on hand. But guess what? During an emergency, they don't work worth a darn. You see, they require power, a power supply. So what we recommend is take a trip to your thrift shop. Karen and I picked this baby up here for five bucks. And sure enough, it's got a dial on it, but that doesn't make any difference. Just plug it into the wall and talk. It doesn't require a power supply and it doesn't require batteries. So get one of these for your emergency goods and keep it on hand. When we're talking about preparing for a disaster, one of the most important topics is the topic of first aid and medicine. Now I'm just going to give you a quick overview of this, but I want you to know that both Karen and I have spent a lot of time going through training programs to learn about first aid. The American Red Cross offers great first aid classes. One of the uh, most important one is called the Basic First Aid Class and CPR. Everybody in your family that's old enough should take those courses. They don't take long and they're critical to your survival. I've also taken advanced first aid classes and uh, what is it called? Mountaineering first aid courses, which is also a form of advanced first aid. And I spent a little bit of time uh, working in an emergency room, so I got to see things a little bit more close up. Now that's the kind of stuff that you need to do to be sure that you've got the skills you need in case of this emergency. Another part of that is the physical stuff. It's the kinds of things that are involved in first aid kits. Now these days you could buy pretty good first aid kits at all kinds of different shops. This one here I think I bought at uh, one of the warehouse shops. It's a, it's a fairly complete first aid kit with 130 different items in it. And this is the easiest way for you to get the stuff that you need. They also sell, when I bought this, uh, a smaller version that also came in the same package. So I've got a larger kit here and a small kit to go along with it. This one here I could put anywhere. Now that brings up the question, where do you put these things? Well, most of the time you treat injuries in some place like the kitchen or the bathroom. So you should keep your first aid kits in the, in the rooms where they're going to be needed. Kitchen and bathroom are the two places people would go to look for these things and make sure everybody knows where they are. If you've got a small child, you could say, go get the first aid kit, and they'll run into the bathroom, if that's where it is, grab the kit, and bring it on out. Now, if you want to, you can make your own first aid kit, and that's what I've done here. This is one that I take with me on mountaineering and backpacking trips, and it's got all the essential items in it. Now, what are those essential items? Now, we could spend a lot of tape looking at those things, but it's better for you to just go get yourself a good first aid book and follow the instructions in there for their first aid kits because they vary from region to region, season to season, and your own personal needs and finances. So make your own kit up, go get some information, you can get it off the internet, thousands of places, but make up a good first aid kit, and if you keep it in the traditional red package like these here, it's easy for people to spot them. Now, we also keep something that's a little bit more uh, majestic, and that's our master first aid kit. Let me. Uh, let me show you what's in this one because this goes well beyond just first aid 
and to another area called treatment. What's the difference between first aid and treatment? First aid is that, that aid that you give somebody who's been injured, that stuff that you do immediately until you can get them to a regular uh, physician, emergency room, or so on and so forth. Treatment goes on beyond that. Sometimes it involves medication, it involves minor surgery, it involves all kinds of things outside of the realm of the first responder. Treatment is something that you need to think about in an emergency. You may be required to do things that you ordinarily would not be trained for uh, by your first aid courses. Our master first aid kit contains a few items that you normally wouldn't see in a first aid kit. On the top here we have an air splint. If somebody breaks a leg or an arm, this air splint can be inflated by mouth and it helps to hold the limb immobile until we can actually get to a physician or emergency room. We've also got a sterile, a sterile uh, burn sheet. This is for those big burns that could happen. Remember, in a, in a catastrophe, you could have some major injuries and this could make the difference between infection and no infection. Now inside here we keep several books. I like uh, wilderness related books because they generally deal with treatment and not just first aid and they also have fairly complete um, uh, first aid kits, lists and so forth and how to use all the items in there. Now this is an older one here, Wilderness Medicine. It's got uh, medical kits and medications and prevention and diagnosis and treatment. Um, being your own wilderness doctor is also an older one but they're both very good if you can get a copy of those. My favorite book is this one here called uh, Medicine for Mountaineering. This is by the Mountaineers and this is actually for long-term uh, mountaineering expeditions and it, it covers everything from spider bites to appendicitis and on and on and on. It gives you the proper uh, dosages for different medications including antibiotics. This is a great book and uh, you could get this thing at a lot of bookstores. In this kit we also keep a um, an ice pack here and we also have an, a heat pack in another portion of it, uh, tongue depressors. But what sets us aside is sometimes you might find yourself with a toothache or, or something like that. We have a little dental emergency kit. If your filling falls out or you lose a cap, it can be very, very painful and disagreeable. So this little kit here can help you to put that, that stuff back together until a dentist becomes available. Another thing that we have in here is a surgery kit. Uh, attached by rubber bands to the outside are sutures, various types of sutures. Those you could buy at pet supply places and, uh, and you can also talk to your doctor about it. This is actually a surgery kit that you, can, uh, that you can purchase from a lot of different sources and it has everything in here from hemostats to um, scalpels to uh, picks and tweezers and wound uh, wound pipes and you name it. It's got it all in there, scissors, whatever. This is a good little kit and they sell for about 20 or 25 dollars. We also keep a flashlight in here and the batteries are separate. We do this for a reason. You may not be in this kit for a long time and if those batteries go bad it'll ruin your flashlight. So keep your flashlight empty and your batteries in a uh, separate sealed case like this one here so if they do go bad they won't destroy the rest of the contents. There are other things in here that um, that are just standard first aid items, uh, disinfectants, eye patches, uh, breathing kits, we've got a um, blood pressure cuff and monitor and so forth. There's also the standard uh, um, band-aids and, um, and, and all the other things that you'll find in your other kits. But remember, this is the master kit. The other kits supplement this, so if you need um, just band-aids, don't get them out of this kit. Get them out of your smaller kits, the ones that you keep in the kitchen or the refrigerator. But I hope that gives you some guidance on uh, putting together your home first aid supplies. Be sure to keep a flashlight, a candle, and a lighter in every bedroom. Fuel type lanterns have the potential of spilling and could be dangerous in an emergency. Wind up lights are a good alternative light source. Be sure to have a portable radio on hand and batteries, of course, to make that thing run. This is going to be invaluable for getting emergency broadcasts and other information. A portable television, something like this one here, might be a good idea. Sometimes uh, these things will give you even more information during an emergency. A cell phone is a handy idea. Your telephone may be out, 
but the cell phone might still work. This is a good communications tool and you should have one. Another thing that's handy is this communication tool and this would be the two-way radios, family style radios. If somebody's out and about helping other people or so forth and you need to be in touch, this is the way to do it. They have about a two-mile range. Make a photo inventory of all your important possessions and put the inventory in a safe place. Chef Ron here with your cooking tip for the day. With all those cans you've got in storage, you're going to need some way to do the cooking. Now your electric might be out or your gas might be out, so it's a good idea to get some sort of a portable stove like this little cheap guy here. That way you can still cook your meals. Now when you're cooking cans, you don't need to dirty any plates. All you need to do is put a little water in a pan, drop the open can in. You see I left a little bit of the top on it there so I could control it. And then after it heats up in the boiling water, just take this off, munch it down, and then you can use the boiling water down there to make coffee or wash up your, pot, your pans or whatever else you want to use it for. Another little energy saving tip, once the water has boiled, just go ahead and uh, turn the gas off and let the can sit in that hot water. That's usually plenty of heat to heat up the chow, but you won't be burning a lot of gas while you do it. Mm. That's good. Be sure to have fire alarms all throughout your house and fire extinguishers. Keep an extra set of house keys and car keys in a safe place and save them only for emergencies. An extremely valuable addition to your uh, communications and information network is a portable hand scanner like this one. With this, you can tap into the police frequencies, emergency frequencies, and fire frequencies and discover exactly what's going on in your neighborhood. To do that, all you need is a list of the frequencies, and you can take those off of books or off, off the Internet itself. We're coming to the end of our information odyssey on urban survival. And the last thing I want to talk to you about here is um, the family disaster plan, and that's probably one of the most important things. Let me go through the uh, basic points. First thing you want to do with a uh, family plan is to identify the threats. Then you need to create a disaster plan. Follow the information we already gave you in the video, and then you need to learn how to maintain your plan. Let me tell you a little bit more about those topic areas. The first thing I said is to find the threats. By that I mean you need to find out what exactly it is that's going to be threatening you. Are you in a tornado area, an earthquake area, a fire or a flood area? Those are things you need to know. Once you know what kind of threats you're trying to solve, then you can take some steps to solve those specific ones. Your community might have specific signals that are ready to alert you that this particular threat is about to happen. Find out about those threats. Some will be on the radio, some might be by telephone. There's a lot of ways that you could be alerted. There's even sirens out there. Another thing, find out about animal care for your animals. Is there a place you could take the animal to before the disaster hits, if you have warning? Or where do you take them afterwards? Animals need to be taken care of. Running loose on the streets is no place for them. Another thing to do is find out who needs help. Is there someone in your neighborhood that's elderly or disabled? You might want to find out who they are and what you could do to help them in case of an emergency. Find out beforehand. You don't want to find out later. And also find out what kind of plans you have at work and at your school. Make sure that they've got something going on. If they don't have any preparations, you need to make them there. The next step is the disaster plan. You need to explain your entire disaster plan to your family. You want to tell them <clears throat> all the details about what it is that you plan to do in an emergency. You need to establish two places to meet. One of those is going to be the home. If there's a big disaster and everybody could come home, they'll do it. But what if the house is in the disaster area and it's been destroyed or something like that? Then you should create an outside of your neighborhood area to respond to. It might be a school, a church, or some other area, but pick an area before the disaster happens and make sure that everybody knows how to get there. The next thing to do is to create a family contact. This will be a person who lives out of state. You want to make sure that, of that because a lot of times the long distance will work, but the local won't work. So you want to make sure you have an out of state contact and you want to make sure that everybody knows that phone number by heart. It knows the name and phone number. It's helpful to know who you're calling. 
But if a disaster happens, everybody should call this person and say, yes, we're okay, and here's where we are, or no, we're not, and here's where we are. But at least there's a clearing area for the information about you and your family. And the last thing is to create a, an evacuation plan for your home. Every room ought to have at least two exits. If not, find out how to get out of your place safely. There's probably a lot of strategies you could use to get out of your home in case of a fire. Find out what they are. Find out what the hazards are in the area in the way you're likely to escape your house. In other words, if you're running down a glass-laden hallway like I did, you might cut your feet open. You might find a better way than going through another potential disaster. The next step is to follow the video. In this video, we tried to give you all of the good information you need about urban survival. This is the stuff that relates to your home. Follow the steps we helped you with do the things that we suggested and you'll be just fine. Your home will be a sanctuary. And finally, practice all the steps that you've seen before. You want to make sure that everybody's been through it physically. There's a couple ways of learning. One of those is to hear about it. The better way is to do it. So make sure that everybody practices. Now in this volume of the Urban Master, we've given you information about your home. In the next version, or the next video, we're going to be talking about information that you might need if you're on the road, if you're at work or if you're at school. We're going to talk a little bit about survival kits for the car, uh, survival kits for, uh, for children, how to use those things, and things that might go into them. We're also going to be talking about evacuation routes and some other stuff. Well, thank you for joining us in this volume of The Urban Master, and we hope to see you next time. Oh, -ho. well, there we are. Another trip, another room, and here's a little traveler's tip for you. Cable ties are the traveler's best friend. That and a pair of uh, fingernail clippers, and you've got good security for your baggage, especially soft-sided baggage with zippers like that. Let me show you a little bit more about cable ties. Whenever I travel, I carry a little bundle of these cable ties. These babies here are about three inches long, and I bought this whole bundle for a buck at a thrift shop. But these things are handy. They hold about 200 pounds, which isn't the idea, but they'll hold your zippers together. They're easy to fasten. And whenever I leave a room, I'll put a little cable tie loop on the zippers like so to keep the thing shut. That way, if somebody comes in and starts to molest my gear, why they're going to find this thing holding it shut. And if they do get into it, I'll know because they will have had to cut it. And that tells me somebody got into my stuff and then I could go hunting. So those are handy. In addition to that, anybody who uses these on their luggage is going to be able to identify their luggage in amongst all those other pieces of luggage with yellow tags and red tags and so forth. Of course, everybody knows that these things come in different sizes, and this one here is, looks like about a six or eight incher. And uh, the wider ones, of course, are going to be a lot stronger, and you could wrap them around other things in your baggage to keep them from flopping around. But again, cable ties, they're a real lifesaver for the traveler. Of course, you can't cut these big ones like this. What am I going to do with it? Here's a little trick I learned many years ago. It sort of slows down thieves and uh, overzealous customs inspectors. Now this isn't a pretty sight. But you see right here in my luggage, right on top, I've got a pair of my underwear. And um, I, I don't know what happened, but I seem to have a little smudge on those undies. Ooh, gross. Well, that's what most people are gonna do. The interesting thing about these under underwear is this. That's not a real smudge. These underwear are specially made. You see, if you reach down inside here, why, down in the bottom there, is my watch. No one's going to really want to take these underwear and examine them. Now, I used to make these things myself, but these days there's a company that manufactures them commercially, so you can buy your smudge on the Internet. But that's a good trick, and there's a lot of ways that you can stink up your luggage to make sure that people don't handle it, and dirty underwear is a good place to start.